welcome to Conversations on Social Issues. Uh, thank you for being here today. My name is Kimberly, and I'm one of the reference and instructional librarians here at Seattle Central College Library. So we host this series every week because we see it as an extension of our charge to promote the freedom of information and open exchange of ideas. So we hope for rousing discussions every week, and whether or not you agree with every single thing that you hear today or find on our shelves in any of our books, we hope that you can remain respectful and engaged um, and have a wonderful conversation. If you'd like to learn more about this topic, we have some resources here. These three are from the library and are available for checkout. If you're interested in learning more about these four texts, then you can go ahead and talk to our speaker Ed about that today. So at the end of this conversation, I'll ask you to fill out a brief survey, letting me know what you liked, what you didn't like, and how we can improve. But next week, Jane Queen Grace um, will be presenting on the rising income gap and inequality in Seattle. But this week, the rousing pan to our speakers, Sonny Meredith and Ed Nesley, as they discuss, will robots take our jobs? The socioeconomic impact of intelligent machines. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming here. As Kimberly mentioned, the topic for today will be, will robots take our jobs? And um, I think Ed and I work in the field and we both independently get the feedback groups and each other can become increasingly concerned about the impact of um, automation, robots, and their AI, and I will define my terms in a moment, on, um, on our society and literally on everyone's job. And also we are concerned about the fact that the mainstream media doesn't necessarily talk about these issues enough and in the right light so that most people are perhaps not aware. So our, our goal is to present you with some information and also to hopefully engage you so that you can, we can try to figure out ways to actually be active about this issue and not just leave you know, a few uh, you know, white guys in the room making decisions that they're going to impact and are impacting all of us. So with that said, I will go ahead and uh, start our presentation. And do we have anything else? Maybe we could just yeah. Um, I, I'm an infrastructure guy. Um, I make a plumbing book. Uh, Stunny is very much involved in the user phase and building applications that people can um, use in the world that, that is, is there. And that's kind of how we bumped into each other. And sort of, we're very concerned with what it comes down to. And, this may turn out, remember it's a conversation, you know, the point of conversation, but it also, most people don't have the terms, don't understand why things work the way they do. So if we get in the kind of lecture, we have a lot of slides, feel free to stop us. We don't have to get, we don't feel like we have to get through the slides to stand, I think you set up so they can be done. Yes, they're definitely going to be available on so yes, please let's do interrupt and do ask questions, not all your questions at the end of the okay. session. And I wanted to mention also special thanks to Cliff, my wonderful TA, and um, he went over the slides and also helped create them. So with that said, let's go again and get started with a little video presentation here in just a couple minutes. Judy! 
um, here are two of these different technologies, you see that big data is essentially, and AI drives essentially every company that you are experiencing in some way or another. Google, PayPal, it's everywhere. Um, 3D printing is already, I think everyone is familiar with 3D printing, is going to get more and more impact as it becomes more available to, um, more affordable, I guess the machines would be. And then we're looking just in a few years from now, we have uh, advanced robotics and advanced AI and uh, advanced uh, biotechnology. We're looking at gene editing, so everything is moving incredibly fast. And um, we're just printing biological parts for the body. 3D printing of biological parts for the body. They're used already as models, for example, in Israel, for uh, having a printed 3D model so that you can look at the organs in a 3D way. But printing of model of uh, tissues for transplants is just around the corner, if not it's already happening. What, the thing that's important is it's a four year timeline. Right. It's four years. It, most of you will be leaving in two years or, or less. And what we're really talking about is the rate of change is so high that it, you're going to have to sort of keep that in perspective. There's machine time and people time. Yes, and we have a special slide about this because it's important. But before that, I wanted to show you another, uh, I guess, infographic from, it's also from the World Economic Forum. I put this guy's website, but it turns out he took it from from the World Economic Forum as well. And so we are losing the jobs in brown and gaining the jobs in blue. And they are shown in different colors and obviously the circles represent what we're losing. So as you can see, the office and administrative jobs are going to be susceptible to a great loss because these are kind of tasks that are routine and they can be easily automated. Also manufacturing and production, which is probably the first that comes to mind for most people at this point, when we think about robots, construction, art, uh, design, entertainment, you, are, you might not think about sports and entertainment, but I'll jump a few slides ahead to tell you that drone races are going to be predicted to be one of the biggest sports coming up in a few years. So if you have some... Racing drones? Racing drones. Racing drones in the air. Or on the land. For fun. For, for sport. For sport. For betting. Yeah. Just like car racing. Drums. Yeah, but imagine big drums, like battle bombs in the air. Battle bombs. Oh, very nice. That's All right. And so, uh, on the other hand, we have some we have some jobs, that some fields that are showing slight increase in numbers. Essentially, we're going to see probably a temporary increase in business and management because we have all these data that is given to us by the analytics of the AIs and somebody has to make decisions. When we talk about narrow AI, the AIs are not yet capable to make decisions, but um, that's going to change when we get to the general AI. Okay? We, yeah, uh, to make it a little more clear, <coughs> what's going on is um, a human being during the day evaluates Evaluation is something a computer cannot do. That's less for most people in most jobs. It's actually around 1%, but it, you can be generous and say 10% because then people use evaluation much more. That means 90% of what we do during the day and we get a paycheck for can be automated. Mm -hmm. And that should give you some pause because the first kind of robots we're getting won't look like people. They'll be very specifically made to look like machines well, so that you won't be scared. Yeah. Someone can look like people. Like in an automobile plant, right? Right. Put together cars and farm. A lot more scale. Oh, yeah. And we're seeing an uh, increase in the highly technical skill jobs, as we, as I mentioned earlier. But overall, uh, you can see the trend. So let's discuss the drivers of robotization. What is actually driving all this, um, all these phenomena, which is all these numbers we just discussed? So um, some of you might not be technically interested, maybe even to know, I'll just go through these. Some of you might be. I'll try to keep the technical jargon to minimum, but we, can, we must discuss a few terms here. One of the drivers is Moore's law. You might, most of you might actually have heard of the Moore's law, which is that essentially the processor speeds double every two years. And it's not really a law, it's a, like a rule, but so far it's been shown yeah. to be accurate every year. Then the big, uh, the very big one is the big data. So as you are aware, probably 
data is accumulated everywhere online, and um, even all of us are sort of, I guess, guilty for contributing maybe with our selfies or maybe garbage data, but in any case, there is so much data available, and so the job of the AIs is to process the da this data and we're getting more and more insights and more and more meaningful analytics out of it. And what that means is that businesses can leverage this information and get um, a lot of great insights and a lot of detail without actually having a lot of skill in, in terms of how the AI works. It may be a black box, you can take it as a black box, but the insights provided are becoming more and more, more you refined. Rent it. So if you're rich, you own the world. If you're poor, you don't get the analytics. So if you're a small right. business, you get eliminated. That's what she's talking about. Yes, pretty much that's what it's going down to. Uh, we are all essentially providing our data to train Google's AI systems and other big corporations. So those free apps that we all love to use, they're not really free. We're actually paying for them by providing our data, which gets aggregated. And the result is that uh, Google's AI gets trained how to eliminate more jobs and hopefully do a few good things as well. Then there is quantum computing, which allows us um, to move, as you again might know, the information on a conventional computer is told to the two bit, so you can only have two states. With quantum computer, you have the qubit, which allows you to store multiple states of the information, and there is tremendous potential for increasing the speed of processing and encryption. Um, six, uh, two, six states is more likely, so it allows you to have three dimensional um, computing and it allows us to handle things in databases that we currently can't do. And it's, we're here now, we're building the first one. We failed currently on two implementations of quantum computers. And you're sitting in where? The place where it happens in Seattle. Also in MIT. Yeah. MIT in Seattle. MIT in Seattle. And, um, we also have a specific, there is machine learning, which is one of the approaches taken by AI to how they can solve these problems. So it's very big and it's used for essentially how to teach computers. They're fed with all this data and then they're taught how to improve and how to make decisions uh, based on patterns and so forth. And it's very interesting, you're probably all familiar with IBM's Watson, which beat... Uh, it beat the chess, beat the chess, world chess champions. Right. And they now have Google's AI is now the Google's Go, Go champion. Right. And that was considered chess is highly regimented, you may realize. The character, the things can only move in certain ways and go. There are individual pieces where you have to build a set of, of blocking maneuvers. And so it's much more difficult to do. We didn't really believe that a computer could win it, go. And now it's been done. It just happened a couple days ago. Two days ago. Uh, also, I'd like you to um, know about genetic programming that's very interesting. That's a programming paradigm that tries to mimic biological evolution. So it's the same idea you have a problem to solve. The difference is that the scientists actually know what problems to solve, whereas evolution works blindly. And then you fit in some parameters and you cause several mutations to happen. And then only the successful programs continue. So it mimics biological evolution. And it's, it appears to be a very successful uh, AI technique. The, um, um, this has been applied, and we're building a series of drugs currently that will extend a human being's life up to 100, and, 100 years and change. So if you are currently, and what it means also, that it can repair your telomere structures so that biologically, if you're losing your hair like I am, um, it means that once you take the regime, what happens is, is that it sets your clock back. And so, you know, where you might get wrinkles at the age of 30, 25, 30, something like that, you might get an extra 10 or 15 years rolls that back. That will probably be available as a therapy in about four years, is currently the, using this technology. Are you saying that a 100 year old person, the future will look like a 100 year old person today? Yeah. I mean, you have, um, your body is only capable of 100 and if you have perfect telomeres, you can only replicate in a cell with cells in life. And if you calculate that out, you can only get to 130 years. The therapy we're talking about using this technology can only get you to 100 years. But it does do some things. Instead of being an 80-year-old or a 60-year-old where you have hip problems, right. knee problems, it basically corrects that. People can have a quality of life. Yeah, but it's only available for rich people. Yeah, for smart people. 
for valuable people, where it becomes part of your employment package. We don't have information on that. So we're talking about some of the current, this technology, and uh, she hasn't got to that yet. Keep, keep going. But maybe we might get closer in a moment, but the answer is no, that we know about. Well, now I'll take my question, in fact, results in this question. Um, so, um, nanotech is a technology that goes on a very small scale and little robots, uh, you know, repairing your board vessels, so that's inject related them. to, I'm sorry? You inject them. According to you, can inject them. Uh, 3D printing, everyone is probably familiar with, with that technology. The Internet of Things it brought here at the Amazon Echo, one example of uh, Amazon Echo. We can't connect it uh, uh, to this side of the campus Wi-Fi. Okay. It's connected over in our... Um, on Lisa net. It still has limits, apparently, but... Yeah, it is um, mobile. So it goes red like this, and um, we can turn this red a little bit. I don't know section of your Alexa And Alexa changes... Um, what, the reason why we brought this is, is you'll notice... No screen. No keyboard. It's voice activated. It recognizes you. Um, it's an Android base. It's an Android device. No screen, and so you'll notice people who build web pages. Sorry, you no job. Um, the world that's arriving in the Alexa can order a pizza for you now. Uh, it can order an Uber for you. Um, and the thing is, is that as you move forward, you probably won't want a screen. Really? Because the screen uses battery. It uses battery life. You'll want the battery life for, for connecting to the assistive intelligence. And so you use voice connectivity. And so you're looking at some fairly substantial changes. And remember that the timelines are talking about is four years. But so what about so the, huh? What about video and photographs? And yeah. The thing is, is that if you look at if you look out there, it, um, the answer is is that you may we may not they may become more personal items. You know, you don't typically show things on your cell phone. You know, those are in your home environment. You know, um, uh, there's some. What you'll notice is that this has it basically has a lot of impact on the way social media functions. And if you talk to us, social media probably is not the best thing for you. You know, you probably, if you're under the age of 10 years of age, you want to eliminate all social media for learning reasons. Um, if you are older than that, it provides profiling. Remember, this assistive intelligence can be weaponized. And that's one of the problems that we're dealing with here is if one hand gives, nothing is perfect, nothing is good, and nothing is evil. In the hands of people, that's where things go south. And I'll give you that. And it's worth mentioning biometrics because often people say, well, I have my privacy. Well, with biometrics, which means that uh, you can get, I think, can give you an example, Jen, you can use your Fitbit, which tracks your biometrics. And so all this is, again, just accumulated and tracked and analyzed. So at some point, we can expect that the we can companies... Clone you. We can clone you. And the companies who uh, so. gather your data is going, are going to know more about you than you know, or about me. Or than, than you want them to you know. Well, certainly, I think that's a given, but we don't know how to solve that problem at this point. And so this brings us to the important idea of uh, technology is growing exponentially. Uh, Ray Kurzweil is a futurist who says there is a law of accelerating um, returns, which means that exponential curves are curves that start out, just, just creep up for a little bit, you don't really see much, and then suddenly your curve is vertical, and that's the rate of technology uh, growth. So we are faced with exponential growth and exponential growth of the rate of change, whereas we can't really fathom what's going on because our minds are middle-sized linear kind of thinking. Um, we're middle-sized linear thinking creatures, so we just cognitively have a hard time fathoming this exponential growth that we're seeing here. But this is how technology goes. You make a good point there, and this chart exactly mimics 
what happens in the social world if we decide to respond to this not as a mere technological challenge, but as a social and political challenge. So this is exactly what happens any time you have a, a social political revolution that decides to take the power back, or not. Um, what, um, may, may I, she'll get to this in a moment. This is what's called the fourth industrial age. You, you're, the university, the college, much of what you're doing here, the colleges evolved over time through the first industrial age, the second and third industrial age. It has been one of the things that has brought the middle class and things like that. What's weird is, is that colleges, unfortunately, are not useful, okay? Because what a college does is it trains us in a linear way for an environment that may not exist. And so where this education provided a way forward, and what Deborah was talking about there, it's a political problem because what happens when the robots do this work, There's, they don't pay taxes, they work 24 hours a day, they need to be repaired, they are owned, so there's concentration of wealth. And so you can begin to kind of connect a dot here that we as technologists are somewhat concerned unless people are aware of what's coming at you. About that, sure. So, um, so actually, exactly what Greg was talking about. Um, another driver of robotiz robotization is that Robert, they essentially beat us. At, they're more productive than us. Um, they can produce. They're less prone to errors. They can produce more in shorter amounts of time. So the productivity of robots beats humans. Further, they save. Um, the result in corporate savings. Uh, corporations waste less material, so they have a high incentive to use as many robots as we all, I'm sure, know than, than they do now. And also robots are actually safer. On one hand, they, they, they're robots that can help with dangerous situations, which is a good one. Maybe our first positive here in this conversation. Mm -hmm. In Fukushima, they can go, they can go and uh, do jobs that humans cannot do. But on the other hand, they also don't suffer injuries or get tired. So they're more, again, employers are more attractive to, or it's more attractive for employers to use robots than humans. And um, if that's not enough, there is a staggering amount of investment. Uh, some, obviously, many people figure out that's a good place to be if you want to make a ton of money. So 1.97 billion, that's for 2015. 42 billion in a single IPO, um, a bunch, 1.27. IPO is a public, uh, offering, public offering. Independent public offering for stock for capitalization to build a product or start a company. So when a company goes from private to public, they have an IPO at this point. Um, and uh, there are many, especially I guess in Silicon Valley and probably in Seattle, um, the so-called Unicorn Club, mm -hmm. where VCs, venture capitalists, who are always looking for the most. Next wave. The next wave, and this is clearly that wave. So the investments since 2014 alone have tripled. So there's a lot of money to make this possible. Here is another interesting um, graph which comes back to what Ed was mentioning about the difference in different countries. It's interesting to note that uh, Asia is, you know, Asia and Australia are way more invested in getting industrial robots. This is the red line, if you can read here. Whereas Europe, Europe and uh, the US, unfortunately, is the lowest, this is the blue line. Uh, but you, uh, Asia is really highly invested in getting more industrial robots. So we have to watch for how this is going to go. Wait. Is that largely Japan? Well, no, it's no. Japan, Korea, Singapore, Hong Kong. Korea is a huge play. Yeah, yeah. Hong Kong is a hotbed for a lot of robotics, so it's not. I yeah. think Japan is known to be. Because of their industrialization, um, the, okay. um, you all know that Cadillac next fall this year will offer a self-driving car. Mm -hmm. um, they'll be on the, on the roads. Um, what's important about these is, is that they create what's called a hive mind. As more cars on the road have the intelligence, they can drive closer together. Because you and I can only see the car in front of us. What they do is they go through the cars and they leapfrog and if you've got 40 cars, 10 miles down the road, the car up there sees an accident 
it tells all the other cars behind it to start using alternative traffic. And so you have device-to-device -device communication and where you have highly dense environments or you have high resource. The reason why Australia is big in this is they, they have lots of mines. They, have, they, are, they don't manufacture, they actually do resource extraction. That's the reason why they're heavily invested. The other flip side of the coin is Korea and Japan, where you might be more comfortable. Their robot is, they, their use of robots is closely tied to industrialization. So what you'll notice is there's not a direct connection between sort of one manufacturing process and the person that. I'm surprised, yeah, I'm surprised about the, I mean, I understand Australia, but I'm surprised about Asia. But how much in Asia, how much comes from India and China, even the manpower that they have? Yeah, India is, um, um, one of the problems that China has, the reason why they use it is, is um, um, much of their population doesn't have the skill set to provide high quality goods. Right. Um, machines and robotization. What's weird is in China, most of the tools that manufacture the products that you buy come from Germany first and probably the US second. Yeah. Okay. And that's where that robotization comes. This is one of the questions. You think about the population, it's too easy to make people, right? You know, robots, you know, what do you what are we going to do? And this is why we're talking to you. We're technologists. This is coming whether you vote on it. There's no vote you get to take. It's arriving. We as human beings have to sort of start to cogitate about a world where this is a challenge. Right. And you, you know, you really, you know, it's fine for us. I mean, sorry. Seattle is cloud central. What that means is, is that this back-end intelligent environment is being built here in Seattle. Mm -hmm. It was in the New York Times. Everybody comes here. Mm -hmm. It's one reason why you're seeing a lot of exponential growth in various companies. You see Amazon downtown, but you don't see Google. My, the two biggest players in cloud are Microsoft and Amazon. They're right here. Mm -hmm. Much of the cloud technology that's being used comes from research out of Microsoft. And so it's kind of a weird paradigm because that makes us the center of this stuff. But it's not translating to people who live here. They're all imports. Mm -hmm. Google, I was going to just mention, we look at Google as well. It, yeah, yeah, Google. Google. So what's, what's India's percentage? Uh, I don't know it, it, the exact figure for okay. it. I'm sorry. It's in the Dallas. Yeah, report. we can probably get back to you on that. Deborah? Um, I think, Ed, you said that um, China, for example, India, they have uh, workers who are uh, unskilled for the work that's needed, is that correct? So the, the what we saw earlier was like, you know, people greeting people and so on. Are you talking about factory work? What sort of work are you referring to? It, in it, as much generality as Remember, you Remember, yeah, the, the Davos report, yeah, the, the Davos report, what made it peculiar is, is that if you have a well-developed delivery system like India and China do based on people, right. there's no impetus to put in robotization unless there's a monetary value in that. And that typically relates to export commodities, not local commodities. I just wanted to say that any time, uh, I mean, I, I take your point, and I believe that was your point as well. These are countries that have a huge amount of human labor. Exactly. What's going to happen to them? Exactly. What, what isn't being stated, although it's implicit in every slide, mm -hmm. is that this is not driven by technology. There's, you know, Moore's Law doesn't implement it. So are we getting to it? Yes. Point take. So far, humans can have a say, which is why we're trying No, to that's not my point. Okay. My point is that we're sitting here, you know, inquiring about the technological implications of this, which, you know, we're suitably terrorized. But the point <laughs> is, this is only being done by and for people who already have the money. This is a class question. If we yeah, approach yeah. this as a technological question, we get absolutely nowhere. It's as if we're throwing our wooden shoes into the factories like the saboteurs did. Well, I think we need to be aware, of, right? yes, yes, and we need to be aware of the technological side of it because otherwise we will be simply blindsided by what happens. I think it is valuable in our discussion, but yes, it's also definitely a matter of people. We'll more slides. And we have more slides, okay. 
So um, we have said already that here's an interesting example, and I guess we're really not moving very fast to our slides, but essentially the other dimension to this is that we need fewer workers to do the jobs. So this example here has to do with Google earned 14 billion in 2012 with 38,000 people, as opposed to General Motors who earned uh, a billion it's many years back, I forgot, 1979, and they were employing 840,000 people. Cleveland, I looked up, by the way, today, Ford is only employing about 260,000. But you can see that's another dimension that we're getting uh, crunched. So I'll just move a little faster since we have a lot more to share. The other uh, driver here is that essentially the humans are operating on autopilot for most of our waking hours, even though we might like to think otherwise. So all the tasks that are um, routine and can be standardized, they can be automated. And believe me, there are companies who are actively looking for making that happen. And so we <coughs> next would like to do a quick review by industry, more specifically. And uh, when we prepare this, we spend special more time on education and IT, just because we just have so many slides. So that's uh, why you see the, the way the slides are organized. These are the kind of jobs that already are done better by AIs, or by, by narrow AIs compared to humans. Pharmacy, stockroom workers, uh, house, household workers, legal assistants, and the financial sector essentially is already run by AI. This is an interesting example. There is a robot that was designed to pick up oranges in uh, California. And the way it was, um, the technology behind it is that it looks at the orange tree, creates a 3D model of the fruits, where the fruits are, and then it uses its eight, its eight hands to pick up the fruits. So I'll try to... <laughs> it doesn't shape the tree. Right. It actually yeah. knows where they are. Yeah. And it doesn't squish them, it doesn't break the tree. Right. Like a human being does. Yeah. Automotive, I think this one is the one that is most popular maybe, so everybody is following. Essentially, we get to drive with cars in few years. Just yesterday, I read that uh, the US, I don't know which branch of the US government, declared driverless cars of Google as legal entities now. So that was the National Highway yeah. and Traffic Safety Administration. Yes, thank you. So that's happening. And uh, education, everyone knows about the MOOCs, the Mazi Falcon online courses, and they were positioned perhaps to you know, eliminate our colleges. It's not working quite like that yet. It seems that even though a lot of students are very excited to sign up for these classes, the research shows that they actually don't complete the work. They, they do need a little more than just going in <coughs> online and reading some lectures. So what research. happens is it, it works really well for you know, the same you know, well-trained people who get the A's in the classes. MOOCs work great for them. <laughs> but the other people, kind of connecting and the framework and all that sort of stuff, that, you know, that doesn't seem to work so well yet. That doesn't mean it won't. We haven't figured it out yet. Right. So it's not as good as it sounds, but it could be improved, probably. And then we're seeing a lot of machine learning applied to giving us quantitative insights into um, learning, which is a probably a good thing. It's, it helps us customize um, a lot of information about how students are doing, what they need to know, what, what they exceed at, and so forth, excel at. And then um, there's a trend. <coughs> about uh, robot teachers. Japan is very fond of robots, as, as it sounds many of you know. So you have Tokyo or purchased 30 robots from this French startup. And also the Technical Education Academy in Hutchinson, Kansas purchased a robot to be a teacher. We also know that in Korea uh, there are robots who are used to replace uh, native English speakers. In Japan, there are robots in the high schools who teach children how to uh, do calligraphy. And um, there is a game which my son happens to use called Scratch, developed by MIT. And this is a sort of drag and drop way to learn how to program. And you know, Scratch is not perfect. And if you're a gamer or something like that, you know about Unity. Um, what these do is, and it's the next way forward, my, my mother manufactures globally. And when she went out um, into her factory, you know, people had manufactured them before, what they discovered was, was that they have Android phones. Um, the Android phones have pictures on them. And so today, you can have a job where you have no education. 
or you use pictures to do what you want in voice. So you choose things on a form by pictures. You don't have to be able to read the form. The, the, the AI will read the form to you. Um, so you get it in language with your dialect or whatever. Gives you the option, say more help, and then we'll read that to you. And so what happens is many of the things that we think about in our daily life, which you would need a college education for, or maybe you'd see you walk into a driver's license bureau and processing a form and not really need it. And uh, there are also automated essay graders, uh, faculty don't seem to like those. Intelligent tutors, and there is a link to a video. We certainly don't have time to look at these videos, but if you want to look at the video, there's a MOOC that will share the slides. And uh, IT is very interesting because a lot of companies who engage in automation say, well, as long as you know how to program, you'll be okay. But what is happening is that um, we are actually, the AIs are calling us out of jobs as well. Uh, in other words, the code is now reaching the capability to write programs. Programs can write programs and improve further. Point of fact, uh, there is a, this one just like the next one, um, jumping ahead a bit, but the Defense Advanced uh, Research Project, um, DARPA. DARPA, is developing software which essentially uses open, open source software and assembles code. One of the things, and the thing is that I'm an infrastructure guy, and we say that administration and building environments because a change in your dealing with the end users is very hard. What's weird is is at the highest level if you have sort of administrators, network administrators, system and uh, domain administrators, enterprise administrators, and finally system administrators. System administrators make about a quarter of a million dollars generally on a yearly basis. It's kind of a basic pay rate. We can automate the system administrators. Yes, you can. The highest paid, what's weird is the ones that are the lowest paid what we call high touch, keep their jobs, but the ones that, you know, because it's highly integrated, it's stable, you're not dealing with things that change on a regular basis. Yeah. So we're gutting the highest paid jobs in many fields in accounting. We expect that within three years to four years, 90% of all accounting jobs will be gone in the U.S., in Europe, in those countries. And um, as of now, uh, there is a, an old time high demand for programmers, so this is not happening tomorrow necessarily, but I think you can see the trend. And um, I need to mention here data science, that's actually, if you want to get into something today, that's probably it's going to be around. Job. It's going to be around forever to be around and grow forever. fast because of quantum computing. Right. So you need to know statistics, you need to know some maps, and then you can learn logic Python. Logic classes. Logic classes, learn Python or some other programming language and learn how to mine the data and create new insights. Um, so this is a job that still appears to be in the growing. growing really growing. And the one important, one other interesting point for faculty members and for students, uh, so I teach mobile development, is projected that the skills the students are going to need to know in the, very, in the near future here, we actually don't know what they are. Everything is moving so fast. I will be teaching these classes, but we don't know what the material will be. Stanley, when you were guessing, you were telling me that you know, things took out would be three, four years out, but I mean, we do it every day, and we were guessing three, four, five, ten years from some of the stuff, and we were making, we had this discussion three months ago. Mm -hmm. but what's happening is a lot of companies are hiding what they're doing because they don't want any competition. It's and it's not popular. Right? And so they want to slip it in and surprise you so that it just suddenly appears and it's like a service. Get Echo. Order your Uber, Uber through Echo. Why bother with that silly cell phone? Yes, Cortana, Google Now. Um, yeah, and those, all of these will get only better. So the last point on IT, I think it's important, is because of the lower bar for skills to IT, I think we can expect the jobs to generally be lower. The salary should be lower because it's just Everybody can join a job. Scratch you know, Unity is kind of a map. It's not. It's not there yet, but it's arriving. So I'll go really briefly through a few other industries. Essentially, the takeaway is that every single industry is impacted by narrow AI, <coughs> including we mentioned sports and entertainment. Oh, and here is a picture uh, happening today in Silicon Valley. 
a company developed these security robots, their security patrols, and they patrol Silicon Valley, and we were looking yesterday with Cliff and wondering what comes out of these. Is it gas? Is it Pepper spray? You know, unkind words. Please move along. Please move along. And then there are the humanoid robots, which it seems that Japan is especially fond of them. And they are especially interesting because they can do the exact tasks as humans, except better. Again, they're better than us. So finally, I guess, thankfully we have time to look at this slide. I think we think. The question, the big question in front of all, all of us is, are we heading towards a techno-feudalism or techno-optimism? In other words, are we going to live in a society where the lords are going to live in castles and they're going to use robots to do the work? They don't need consumers anymore because the robots produce what they need and then it's just, you know, you out, you out your consumers and you out your workforce. Or are we going to use technology to solve climate change, poverty, and all kinds of other problems that we face? and we seem to not be able to figure out uh, with our human intelligence in this point. Let's talk about some of these books here so that you can kind of get a feeling for this. Um, the techno-optimism side would be sort of a book that came out about three or four years ago by Thomas Friedman, The World is Flat. And he goes around the world and talks about some of the great impacts of you know, technology and what we're doing and how, we're, you know, how well it's working out in the world. You know, so this is one of the ones for the optimism category. Yeah. Um, the problem is the next one next to it. It's yeah. smoking yeah. mirrors. Yeah. 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 Right. <laughs> this one is the one that sort of says no cold water, cold water, and really not, you know, remember there's two sides to every coin and the internet is not the answer. And um, you can be a Luddite if you what's want. I don't question? think that's reasonable. Huh? What's the question? Is that I'm wondering? You see that title. The internet is not the answer. The, the answer is, is no technology. Okay, It's that the technology is beyond the scope of human beings to gather. We're linear thinkers. And many of the things that Sandy and I work with on a daily basis are what are called precursor technologies. We haven't seen the full impact of them yet. Most of you do not have 3D printers at home. Most of you do not have assisted intelligence at home. don't have an Alexa. You know, most of us, you know, you'll find that many of our students are very interested in web pages and some of these things, and that we can just identify that there's technologies that are going to become a challenge. Just to follow up on what I was sure. saying, that book says the internet is not the answer. The answer well, what is the question? It's not the prosperity, answer. Prosperity, prosperity, better living. Um, when the internet first came out, there was the notion of it's going to democratize society, it's going to be a great it force. Is, it has nothing but upside. Paul, and then just yeah. I mean, thank you so much. Yeah, just that last question. Like, um, I know the question is what will robots take for jobs, but I think maybe it's like, what kind of society do we want? Mm -hmm. How do people mm -hmm. do we want to be? Yeah. And so that's why I thought like, yeah, what question is what kind of society do we want? Mm -hmm. So totally agree with that. Yeah. And so that's why I thought like, yeah, what question is what's, what's the, what, so totally, yeah, the internet is what it's not. That's the question. But and I, I don't know if I mean, you've talked about people living in, that was not the discussion yet, but people living in castles having robot butlers and the, everyone else. But, these uh, but at least they solve climate change. I just don't know if they're, if those are exclusive. Like we could, we could solve climate change, we could solve hunger, let's say, but yeah. still have. I can add, uh, so here, yeah. Lisa, one, one thing here is, is that many of the people, the unicorns, the VCs, the people we're talking to, are extreme libertarians. You know, if you think about Ayn Rand, you know something about Ayn Rand, right. it's all the worst parts of it. Peter Thiel. Yeah. Peter Thiel. And, yeah. Peter Thiel. And, yeah. And so we have some, the thing is, is that remember, they have the money to buy things. We've got the numbers, but they've got the money. And, you know, you look at some of the, anyway, go ahead. Uh, well, if you, uh, as far as the case for techno optimism, like you, you see in the past, like in, in the 50s, they never would have imagined that everybody has a computer, and now most people in the world have a cell phone. But the difference with robotization is that as you replace human labor, the value, the economic value of human life is decreased yeah. because you don't need people and that they become a burden on the economy rather than not. So if we can figure out a, a way to or reverse that 
sort of macroeconomic pressure or entirely change our economic system, that might be a way to solve the outmoding of the community. Mm -hmm. set the stage, if you will, for those people who might want to move up through to that next level. We need to set expectations that an education will no longer be a middle class education and that you have to at some point divide education into a high touch education and a theory based one. So it means that you will have a four or five year one emphasizing high touch that computers can't necessarily automate, and then one that is heavily theory-oriented, where basically the exit point, you enter in, and then you exit out as a PhD. You don't get the choice. Well, I think we have one more possibility, which is to, I think what we actually do, Bitcoin is application training. So we essentially become craftsmen, and we, craft, we teach you how to use certain tools, uh, how to make websites. It's not so much in, in order about computational thinking but about putting together certain technologies in a certain way. So that's probably a near term intermediate intermediate to get us further away. And we need to be lifelong learners because as you can see everything is moving so fast. If you get if you get your degree tomorrow you must keep on learning otherwise you drop some the challenge is money. Um, and uh, so no, the robotization is not going to stop us. Keep on with that. But this is the important one. And Deborah, this is your slide, Deborah. <laughs> so we, we need political action. We need techno activism so that we can have our say here. And uh, that may be my slide, but none of those are my solutions. So right. I'm just saying. Uh, all right. The solutions that we have discovered uh, doing some research are global technology tax on the companies who produce 
technology and benefit from it. So it's income re reallocation. Reallocation right. of income, UBI, I am actually a big fan of this solution. Um, not very popular probably with many people, but essentially everyone should get a... You're a human being, basic. you deserve to have income. a life. Right? Is that income now? That's, uh, that's redistribution on, yeah. the, where instead of it being a global tax, right. where it would apply to everybody, it would be basically by country defining what a universal basic income would be. So people don't have to scratch for rent. Correct. Right. So there's already exactly. taking place in Denmark and some other countries, yes. and we can move this up for this. What, what was the income allocation? The global tax technology. Global technology tax, so that if you put a robot in place and you unemploy a massive amount of people, a tax would be applied to the ramifications of that, of that technology. Kind of like a carbon tax? But like a carbon tax. Right, that's exactly. Exactly. And two more advice, I think those are important. Okay. The regulation we, is not, there are ways to get around this, we know it outsourcing, but we must try to get the political system engaged in this process. And I think that's very important as well. Um, Right now, there is a set of, again, you know, no offense, but white males who are dominating this field and we need to get... <laughs> you're okay, you're good. No, no, we're white males. Yeah, yeah, trust me. Power. Yeah. We need to get more diverse voices in this conversation. Uh, you know, women have a different mindset about problem solving and so forth, and that would be very important. We need a lot of people at the uh, table with this. <laughs> well, we couldn't go through the fun slides, so oh, if you guys want to have another talk, um, I'm here to host one, and thanks for coming. Well, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. The last shot, I mean the last thing. In your opinion, what is the distant future?